Many of you probably already know, is we're heavily involved with the mailing list. And on the mailing list, one of the chief contributors is Mr. Wolf Richter. Um, there's rarely a week that goes by without at least a handful of certain contributions of good ideas. Uh, so uh, we thought it was only natural to actually come up so you guys can meet the man in person and actually, well, everybody has to say about circuit design. But I'll turn it over to you both. Thanks for coming. Thank Thank Welcome, everybody. The uh, Canada Robotic Games, and uh, I'm going to be presenting some information about a year's worth of circuit design. Um, the circuits that we're covering are beam circuits, and I use the term beam in a kind of a generic way. There are certain circuits which are known to be beam circuits, and there are, in some cases, patented circuits. Uh, beam is a word which is coined by Mark Tilden and stands for biology. Electronics, aesthetics, and mechanics. The idea is that you want to use the elements of nature and mechanics and electronics, combine those into your robot so that it will act in a way that gives rise to what's called emergent behavior. The whole idea is that you can use very, very simple circuits, very simple mechanics, and yet get very complex behavior. I've made up a, a bit of a presentation, and uh, I'll, let me just plug in the, the laptop. Hand it up. All right. So the name of the lecture is Beam Circuit Design. It's Will Craig here. I have 30 years' experience in electronics, and I started out uh, building strobe lights for the high school band, and I actually went on a tour with them and uh, did the light shows for. Band for music. And that goes back even longer than that. But uh, I got seriously after um, going to BCIT and doing a diploma in electronics. I um, was getting serious about electronics and I built my first computer in 1980. Uh, it was actually a hand built unit from scratch using an 885 mm -hmm. microprocessor chip. And then there was this huge gap during which I was working at uh, BC Hydro, which is a utility in, in BC. And there I was involved in designing a uh, high power lab. At the lab, I do tests and do research and development on very high power equipment, such as youth and generator stations, substations, transmission lines. And the uh, power in those tests is current goes up to 100,000 amps, the voltage goes up to 50,000 volts. The power is enough to blink the whole city of Vancouver from time to time, especially if we get to do these tests at night, and literally the city blink in the right place. And what's interesting about this is that that seems like a long, long ways away from, from being electronics. But in fact, during these tests, we have to measure the current and voltage various parameters, sometimes you have to measure pressure. And these are actually relatively small signals compared to the tremendous amount of electrical noise that's generated by the tester. So in order to be able to do that, I have to deal with microwatts in the presence of megawatts. And the circuit design for the electrical circuits are pretty straightforward, simple circuits, simple LRC type circuits. It doesn't use any active components, but it does use the equivalent of relays in the circuit range and so on. And um, in designing the circuits, you find that things happen when the currents are and the voltages are that high that are quite surprising. And in fact, there's a lot of research that's still going on despite the fact that the technology itself is not very high tech. And the circuits are very simple, and yet the uh, results are very intriguing, very interesting, often bordering on the chaotic. Many of our tests uh, are performed on things like fuses and uh, including power arcs and so on. Power arcs are uh, random events. Now I'm using this as an illustration of how simple circuits can have very complex behavior and how you know, simple designs and simple circuits can affect our everyday life because just the, the circuit of the electrical utility is what affects us every day. In a way, uh, beam has the same kind of simplicity and at the same time has great potential for 
providing a very high degree of functionality uh, despite the simplicity of the circuit. I built my first robot in 1999. That was um, shortly after I joined the list, which was very late in 98. And so I've really been involved in the game uh, for the last three years. I was invited uh, last year to speak at the robotics games at Jerry Calgary. And uh, I really had a lot of fun, so I was trying to get to this day for a moment. Glad to hear it. <laughs> I don't want to come back, it sucks. The word beam was coined by Mark Tillman way back in 1994 when he was uh, still at the University of Waterloo. And he was involved in a very similar type of uh, situation, uh, again, organizing games, robotics games. And as I mean to try to get people to uh, build simple robots rather than tackle very complex robots and allow them to get very quick results, he suggested using a simple approach. And this is the word being encapsulates this idea of uh, using elements from nature and using that as a model to create uh, new robots. surrounded by active cells, there's a limit to the number of active cells that can be surrounded by. Either uh, there are too many or too few will influence whether or not that cell, the, the emergent cell, will be born or will die. And based on that very simple rule that if the cell is surrounded by two other cells that are alive, it stays alive. If it's surrounded by three cells, a new cell is born. And if it's fewer or greater than that, the cell will die. And if you take that one step at a time, then on the screen you'll see the development of a um, very complex organization which is based on these absolutely trivial, simple rules. Well, the same thing is true of Beam. You use an extremely simple uh, device which has a very simple algorithm built right into the hardware. It's a hardwired device. It doesn't use microprocessors or microcontrollers. Instead, it uses the hardware logic combined with the mechanical device and the interaction between the electronics, the sensors, the motor driver, the legs, the whole mechanism uh, gives rise to very complex behavior. And all the robots you will see today, and many of them are controlled by, by beam circuits, and you'll notice how even though they are simple in their small transitions, in other words, they may sit there for a while and take a, a short burst of energy to move around. If you were to look at this over time, and were to record it, for example, by attaching a pen to the robot, you'd see some very complex patterns of behavior and of movement. So autonomous automata is a way to describe these uh, robots. They are not robots necessarily in the conventional sense. They are uh, more like machines that behave independent from uh, a human operator. So they will interact with their environment and uh, they will react to their environment and in fact they could change their environment. Uh, Mark Tilden has suggested that uh, these robots would be quite suitable for, for example, clearing minefields. And the, the amount of logic required for a robot to traverse a, a field that's known to have mines in it and to essentially self-destruct on a mine is not very high. So these robots could be made very inexpensively and could be used in large, in large numbers. Similarly, uh, it's been suggested that uh, these robots could be used, for example, uh, sent to Mars or to the Moon and could provide a way in which uh, uh, an environment is created that's suitable for uh, more complex devices such as uh, uh, rockets, uh, communities, uh, people interacting with the, with the environment on, in these very hostile locations. One of the problems, for example, on, on Mars and on the Moon is that there is fine dust everywhere and that would clog 
um, equipment and so that could represent a hazard. Uh, very simple devices that are solar uh, powered could be spending years on the surface of Mars or on the Moon uh, providing a kind of a vacuum cleaner effect, uh, dusting and mopping up all the, the dust and creating the conditions that are right for uh, human, human occupation or human exploration. I put uh, Occam's razor on here because Occam's razor is a um, uh, an approach that's used in science to try to reduce a, a theory or a formula to its absolute simplest form while it still completely describes the uh, way in which uh, some process or, uh, or uh, uh, physical problem behaves. And by using uh, Occam's razor, and Occam is a, a philosopher from the 15th century, who uh, first proposed that uh, the simplest is, uh, in fact, the best explanation of any explanation of how physical things work. And this applies also to beam circuit design. In other words, there are many ways in which you can design a circuit. But the simplest way in which you design a circuit which still performs the function is the best way. It saves money. It allows you to for the same number of components allows you to get much higher functionality and it just makes it simpler to understand and easier to uh, troubleshoot, for example, and debug a circuit. The more complex the design, the more difficult generally it is to debug and, 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 uh, and troubleshoot such a design. It's also uh, much more difficult to see what happens to various components in a circuit if they are very complex and very closely tied together. So I always recommend that when you do circuit design you do it in a modular fashion so that when your circuits are uh, made up out of these various modules you can separate each module from the rest of the circuit and isolate problems that way. And we'll get into that when we start actually looking at uh, the, the circuits themselves. So beam circuit designs are based in general on nervous networks and um, I use the term cautiously because uh, Mark Tilden, although he has suggested that nervous networks are the core of beam circuits, that uh, he is now also going towards um, a uh, microcontroller approach. Now he will still use, I believe, the the basis for beam circuits and in other words emulate nervous networks in microcontrollers but by it appears as if especially for some of the newer devices that are coming out and that are being commercialized the, the biobots that will very likely go in that direction am i right uh, that uh, uses a microprocessor it is a microprocessor yes. based device yeah. it's traditional blob technology you crack it open and see the circuit board with a big blob on it right so this is probably done primarily for commercial reasons, right? It allows you to um, create uh, uh, robots that can be pro essentially programmed at the factory to behave in a certain way. And these new biobots are designed with personalities burned into them. They're still hardwired, and it appears as if they don't seem to have uh, the ability to learn as such, but their behavior is very complex to begin with, and so it's quite all right to have a, a design that, that doesn't have that very high level of sophistication as long as it's interesting and as long as it behaves in a complex way in the real world. Uh, Mark Tilden's uh, serious uh, effort is in biomorphology uh, where he, I believe, is called a, um, uh, a robotic physicist. Neuromorphic physicist. Neuromorphic physicist. Neuromorphic physicist. I see. And it's a, it's, it's a branch of uh, robotics that uh, investigates how uh, robot circuits can be uh, made using uh, nervous, the nervous system, the human, as well as uh, uh, the animal nervous system, as a, uh, a template or a model for uh, designing networks which produce control generally at a low level. Now, by this I mean <coughs> 
if you think of the uh, CPU or the microcontroller as a brain, and the spine and the nerves that uh, are in your body as the nervous network, then the, the, the control that's being exercised is actually at the point where the connections are made from the brain to the muscles and where we get the senses from our touch, from our hearing, our eyes and so on. At that point, uh, there really is no intelligence as such, but there's a lot of processing that's going on. And so these networks are designed to take the place or behave in a similar fashion to biological Neur neural, neural networks. In Beam, um, it's a simpler approach. Uh, we, we don't really get too involved in trying to emulate uh, the human or animal uh, neur neurological system. Rather, we use certain elements that behave in, in convenient ways to make up, uh, as, and use those as building blocks, to make up more complex networks that behave in this complex way. And one of the uh, types of uh, devices is called a nervous neuron. It is, in fact, a very simple uh, device, which is uh, no more than a differentiator followed by a gain block. And that gain block can be either inverting or non-inverting. The so-called new neur neural neuron is actually an integrating device. And it takes as its input, uh, usually an, an R and a C, and the R is in series with the signal, and the C is to ground. When we get to the schematics, I'll point these out to you. The central pattern generators are uh, combinations of these NV and NU neurons, which are hooked together in either loops or sometimes in branches, and give uh, a number of pulses. Each one of these pulses represents some control signal that can be used to control motors or to enable uh, the um, sensors to be read, for example. So, <clears throat> looking at the motor circuits first, um, the conventional designs uh, use a variety of uh, sort of building, standard building blocks. And the H-bridge is one of them, and the H-bridge uh, consists of a, a number of semiconductor components, that more or less take the form of an H with a motor in the middle and the two legs uh, consisting of uh, transistors. You can also have an H bridge which is made out of relays and uh, a double pull, double throw relay with the relay with the um, terminals wired up in such a way that the motor is between the two sets of double pull uh, or single pull, double throw sections acts very similar to an H-bridge. And again, with the schematics, we'll cover that as well. So H-bridges uh, also are take the form of the simple CMOS devices, such as the 74HC and 74AC 240s. They can be hooked up. Their outputs behave like two sets of transistors between power and plus 5, or VCC and the motor is connected between the two outputs to give an H-bridge H as well. Speed control. We don't use much speed control in uh, Beam, but there is a good reason for using speed control. Uh, there are two ways in which you can control the speed. One is the simple on-off, or you can do a variable voltage or current through the motors. And you can achieve that most efficiently by putting pulses on the motor and using the, the ratio between the on and the off of the pulse to set the current through the motor. Uh, the reason why it's efficient is because the switching device is either on or off. And because when a switching device is either fully on or fully off, it dissipates very little power, such a control device would be very efficient in dropping very little power in the switching circuit itself, and most of the power would go to the motor. Uh, plus with servo position, in most um, beam circuits you'll see that, that servo, hobby servos, have been modified to remove the H-bridge that's inside the hobby servo and remove the control circuit that normally takes a pulse width modulated signal and produces a position based on the width of the pulse. The pulse is 
uh, nominally about 1.25 milliseconds and can be plus or minus 25 milliseconds or 250, millisec uh, 250 microseconds. The pulse width modulation for servo positioning it can be readily um, achieved in using beam circuits. And uh, when we look at the schematics, I'll show you a very simple way in which you can use the hobby servos without actually hacking them and removing the inner circuits. So that's another way in which you can use uh, hobby servos. And in fact, despite the fact that the overall circuit tends to be a little bit more complex, there's less work involved in uh, being able to put together a circuit that actually works. Steppers, um, very few stepper applications in beams, but we'll cover one anyway because it's so simple and it uses the standard beam microcore and uh, it's, it's kind of a nifty circuit. Solar engines uh, come in various types and uh, they are depending on, so I should explain what a solar engine is. A solar engine is a very simple device that takes the output of a solar cell to charge either a battery or charge more conventionally a capacitor and then based on the voltage on the capacitor or based on time or based on the slope of the charging current a trigger is created in using a voltage sensitive device or a timer or a some other sensing device so that at a point on the charge after the capacitor generally is fully charged the capacitor is then dumped into a, into a motor and actually performs work. And what's important about this is that solar engines are a way to concentrate power. Uh, the power that's available from a solar cell is actually a, uh, a low-grade power. In, unless you have a very efficient solar cell or unless you use a large number of solar cells, there may not be enough current to actually move a motor. But by storing the current that's generated by a solar cell in a capacitor in a battery and then applying as a short burst but high current to the motor, you've concentrated the power. You've in fact improved the quality of the power from this low grade, which is not usable, to a very high grade of power, which is very usable, very efficiently usable power. We'll talk a little bit about head designs and um, what what is a head? Uh, well, you've Many of you are already familiar with heads, but in general they are a single motor, a gear motor, which is used to orient a set of, um, a set of optical sensors. And the way that the head operates is as a, a balancing device. It's a servo mechanism in itself, and it uses the light output of the two, uh, the light sensed by the two um, sensors. They could be light dependent resistors or they can be photodiodes and based on the balance of the light on the photosensors will operate uh, the motor in one direction or the other and thereby turning the head towards the light source. So despite the fact that it is probably the simplest of all servo mechanisms, it is a very interesting circuit because when you look at it and when you uh, interact with it, it will actually follow you and track you as you, for example, move around the room or if it's used on a robot, it can be used for uh, sensing the location of a light source so that the robot can then re react to that position of the head that's pointing toward the light source and reorient itself and go towards the light source. Now, the robot itself can act in exactly the same way. And in fact, the head, in a way, behaves like a robot with wheels that's a photo photovore or a phototropic design where the robot itself steers itself in the direction of the light. Well, the head does that, but it is immobile, it doesn't actually do anything other than rotate and unless it's mounted on a mobile platform it would be static, uh, statically located. So it's in fact very similar to the way that um, a flower would, or a flower or plant would follow the sun to maxima maximize capturing the light on the leaves. And, and in the same way a head design can be used, a head can be used to orient a, a photocell so that it always points towards the sun by maximizing the, uh, the amount of power that's generated by the solar cell. There are many ideas that, uh, for using heads. Uh, one is to follow the sun uh, as a kind of a sundial, or another would be to create shade. So that, you know, if you're out on the beach and you have your um, head-controlled shade, it would nicely follow the sun and you'd never have to move your butt. So. 
Um, talk a little bit about Beam Logic. Um, on the list, uh, the on the Yahoo Groups uh, Beam list, uh, there is a very very active uh, mailing list. Uh, it's probably one of the most active ones uh, on the on the um, on the net. We get on the average about a thousand to uh, twelve hundred messages posted in a month, which is an enormous number of messages. So uh, there's also uh, archived, lots of archived material. So if you're looking for any kind of information, you can just do a search and search for a particular keyword, and you'll get to right to uh, the thread that will um, where this is being discussed. So it's a fantastic resource, both for uh, participating and getting information, for asking questions, and for um, as using it as a resource, as a as a database for for ideas. Um, so some discussion has been uh, made of using logic in beam circuits. One of the one of the features of a beam circuit is that it uses the simplest of all uh, logic devices, mostly inverters or non-inverting devices, and you may say, well, why not go for more complex logic devices? And the main reason is that the, these very, very simple devices allow you to understand, really understand what's going on at a level which is obscured or masked by using uh, logic. Quite often, the solution to uh, using or a solution to a problem is by using a black box. Get it off the shell and say, okay, I put two signals in, I get one signal out. I know how this, how it behaves as a black box. But it doesn't actually tell you anything about what's go going on inside the black box. Beam is a way in which the black box is opened up and is ex exposed. So you, you're actually looking at what happens inside logic circuits when you're designing beam circuits. They are at such a low level that you can see exactly how the electrons interact with each other and create the, the from input to output, create the, um, the, the, the signals. This is quite different from using a, a black box approach where um, you're buying something off the shelf. You're really not learning very much. Yes, you're using it, but you're using it as the way you might use an appliance. You have, don't have to know anything about what goes, goes on inside the appliance in order to be able to use it. But as a learning experience, it's not nearly as, uh, as uh, good as using a very simple approach and understanding what goes on inside. The sensors will cover um, various sensors that are used, uh, including um, some the, I've mentioned to you the uh, use of uh, photosensors, and there are several different uh, designs that we'll cover. Uh, in addition to that, I'd like to just cover the beam sonic uh, design. The beam sonic design uh, goes a little bit beyond the complexity, the normal complexity of the circuit, and it combines a number of elements in a way that uh, turns out to be quite useful and gives rise to complex behavior. Um, that we'll discuss when I when we look at the circuit, and the monochore matrix is the final slide which I'll present, which is uh, a network uh, which behaves in a very complex fashion, and yet is made out of the absolute simplest of all configurations, and we'll discuss that uh, in a moment. Okay, this is uh, time to switch over to the overhead projector. I apologize for the quality of the of the projector. It's not the greatest, but hopefully we can make it up. Okay. Now, can everybody see that? Not too far out of focus, right? Okay. Oh, need a trusty pointer. Okay, um, rather than because uh, the, there are lots of websites where you can go and you can get information on uh, standard H bridges and standard monocore, or microcores and bicores, and this uh, lecture is designed to really delve a little deeper into various circuits. So we're going to take it one step beyond, but whenever possible, I'll point out within a circuit 
how these other basic elements, more basic elements, are being used. And this circuit uh, was a circuit that was designed based very much on a conventional H bridge, but it has some rather interesting behaviors. Now, the, the basic H bridge design is the use of four transistors with a motor at, at the midpoint. So you can see there's a figure H or a letter H that's, that's shown there. Now, normally speaking, you would turn on this transistor and this transistor simultaneously for current to pass through the motor back to ground. So that would then cause the motor to turn in one direction. Then if this is turned off and these two are turned on, the current would pass through in the other direction and the motor would reverse. So that's the way that an H-bridge normally operates. Now because the, these devices require a certain amount of base current, these are transistors, and I've chosen the 2N3904, 2N3906 transistors as examples, uh, and they are good only for very small motors, but the same principle applies to larger transistors, and for that matter to uh, MOSFETs and, 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 uh, and even bigger transistors. This particular circuit takes advantage of the fact that it the, it's called a T-head bridge circuit, and in this configuration, it actually is a complete head circuit design. It uses the LDRs as a bridge, and the balance of the bridge determines whether or not the voltage at this point is greater or less than the midpoint. If the light is perfectly balanced, this would be at 3 volts if we are using a 6 volt supply. And this is matched to the voltage on the reference bridge. It's at this end. Now, when these two voltages are identical, the bridge shuts off, and so it goes into a tri-state mode. There's no current passing through the motor. So it saves power when the light on the two LDRs, the light-dependent resistors, is identical, when it's balanced. When there's an imbalance, this voltage rises or gets higher or goes lower with respect to this voltage, and now what happens? When this voltage rises, the voltage on the base of this Q1 rises to a point where the voltage will be developed across R1. When that happens, the voltage on the emitter of Q8 starts to rise, which causes the Q8 to turn on. So now the current passes through Q1 and Q3 because Q3 is supplied by the base current of Q, uh, the base current of Q3 is supplied by Q1 and Similarly, Q8 supplies the base current to Q6. So now the current path is established and turns the motor towards the light. In other words, if the LDR is light on one, uh, one LDR receives more light than the other, then the motor is oriented in such a way that it will turn the head and the sensors towards the light. Now this is a circuit which is different from the conventional uh, from the conventional H bridge and it's shown here for this particular application. But it can be also used as um, a, an output device for, for example, a microcontroller chip. If these LDRs are replaced with a connection to an output pin from, um, the, uh, from for example, a PIC microcomputer, then what can, you can do is this. You can have bidirectional rotation of the motor, but at the same time, you can also turn the motor off using a single pin. And as far as I know, there aren't very many uh, circuits that actually use this feature. So in general, you need to provide two pins in order to control the direction of the motor. So you have three states. You have either left or right or turned off. Now, there, there are two ways in which you can turn off a motor. You can either turn the motor off and have it sitting uh, completely isolated from the power supply, or you can turn off uh, the motor by applying a voltage the same voltage on both sides of the motor. So in other words, if these two transistors are turned on, then plus 6 volt is applied to both sides of the motor. Now that means that there's no current passing through the motor, but since the motor can act like a generator when you're, for example, turning the shaft, this provides a short circuit for the current that's provided by the, by the motor. And as such, it acts like a brake. In fact, it's called a dynamic brake. So as uh, this can be very important for certain applications. A good example of uh, an application that uses this type of dynamic brake is a spill saw. As soon as you let go of the trigger, the spill saw almost instantly comes to a halt. 
the reason is that you don't want it to spin a long time after you release the trigger, so that would be dangerous. And it is done by just simply shorting out the windings of the motor, so that the motor, which acts now like a generator because it is no longer being powered by the power supply, is acting like a generator, which is short-circuited, so it has to do a lot of work to, to provide the short-circuit uh, current. And as a result, it slows down very rapidly. Now, this particular design, the, the T uh, bridge, doesn't have the brake feature, but it does have this ability to have bidirectional control of the motor and tri-state across the motor so that the motor is off. And so you can, um, if it takes two pins to control a motor, normally speaking, for bidirectional operation, you can reduce the, by, by a factor of two, reduce the number of I.O. pins required to control the motors for bidirectional operation using a microcontroller. Okay. Uh, it's um, one thing that I should point out is that despite its apparent simplicity, this is uh, quite a unique design. I, I have been following um, electronics for 30 years and I, I, I keep very closely in touch with the developments in electronics. And I'm always looking for new ideas myself, but I haven't come across this particular one. Yes, it borrows many different uh, circuit elements from other designs, but this particular design is quite unique. So. I was quite uh, pleased with the results. Are there any questions about this one? Okay, let's go on to something a little bit more complex. I hope that uh, I can put this over a little bit more. I'm not sure if that actually helps. Oh, wait a minute. Aha. Ah. Okay, can everybody see that? Look at the detail. Okay. This um, I can disconnect this for you if you'd like to. Yeah. Can you step over that? I can probably, yeah, if you don't mind, yeah, maybe you just move this over a little bit. Okay. In my case. That's good because uh, these are getting a little bit more dense, these circuits, so they're a little bit harder to see. Okay, this, uh, this particular circuit, uh, I picked this one because it, uh, it incorporates a number of uh, quite interesting elements. And uh, again, there are many standard circuits, and for beginners, I may not, I wouldn't suggest that you would start on this circuit, but I'd like to just point out how you can, by just making very small changes, how you can actually increase the functionality of these circuits by, in some cases, double it. Okay, just to get started on this, this circuit has a central pattern generator which consists of a so-called ground, grounded bicore. That two inverters with two NV neurons in series and they're looped so that you're creating essentially an out-of-phase square wave. In addition to that, we have a what is called a, a phase delay circuit, which uses a single, a single um, inverter with a, an RC network, which is connected. The L, I'm oh, sorry, the R and the C are each connected to the outputs of the bicore. This is in itself a kind of an unconventional way in which we generate a delay. Almost all um, all uh, phase delay circuits, so-called new neurons, use a grounded capacitor and have a signal applied through the resistor. In this case, I actually use both the um, 
both two signals, the two out-of-phase signals from the bicore are applied to each input. So it acts as a combination of an NV and an NU neuron. And the big advantage of that is that it is insensitive to polarity. Normally speaking, an NU with a grounded capacitor uh, is, a, or a, an NV with a, gra with a, uh, a grounded resistor is sensitive to the polarity. In other words, it produces a pulse out only uh, for an, a pulse in of a certain polarity. And after the pulse is decayed, then applying the pulse in the other direction won't produce an output. This circuit, on the other hand, is insensitive to that. So it's, it actually takes both negative and positive pulses and produces a delayed output. The output of the bicore is um, amplified using the standard H-bridge that uh, Mark Tilden uh, has uh, shown in its absolute simplest form. This is uh, one of Mark's, uh, I guess, signature signatures is that he takes circuits which have been perhaps used in the past and reduces it to uh, its simplest component count. And that's the case here. Uh, and it uses the, the same arrangement of the H-bridge, but I have shown it slightly different here with a crossover of the, the two transistors. But it behaves exactly the same way. and allows me to place the driver transistors on both sides. And what's interesting about this circuit is that the current that passes through the uh, transistors from, for example, plus through the motor through here has to pass through these two transistors. Now the transistors have to be turned on hard in order for the full voltage to be developed across the motor. If you don't have the, uh, if the, if there's a large voltage drop here and a large voltage drop there, then that subtracts from the voltage that's across the motor. So <clears throat> by turning these transistors on hard, you can reduce the voltage drop across the transistors and apply the full potential of the power supply across the motor and therefore get the maximum power. The problem is that by turning these on as hard as you can, they, you can waste a lot of power as well. And so the current passes through the base of the driver transistor into this transistor. The beginning of these two transistors together is about um, something of the order of about a thousand. Uh, and so what you have to do is you have to think of the right resistor here in order to set the current that's passing through here and it's essentially wasted power because this current for example the current that passes from ground through this base of the transistor through the driver transistor back into the plus supply that's wasted it's not applied to the motor and so you have to very carefully choose what that current is now you do that by setting this, setting the current with that resistor. And in this particular case, 47K provides you with something close to 100 millivolts or 100 milliamps of current fully saturated. If you have a motor which uh, draws more than or has a resistance which is so low that it would draw more than 100 milliamps, then the transistors would come out of saturation and then you would have a problem with a voltage drop across the transistors. So it's a balancing act between producing sufficient base current to uh, have the, the transistors go into saturation, but not so little as to, uh, or not so much as to waste a lot of energy. Yeah. Why wouldn't you go with the MOSFET configuration on, on the H versus the okay. power losses? There are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that MOSFETs, unless they are low voltage type MOSFETs, require significant gate voltage. Not only that, although there are uh, two polarities available in MOSFETs like there are in bipolar transistors. The uh, N-channel transistors are generally much uh, lower channel resistance, a lot cheaper, and there aren't very many P-channel type MOSFETs that are low voltage devices, logic level type devices. So you end up with, uh, you end up with MOSFETs which are better in the sense of they don't require any base current and therefore they are not lost in that sense, but they require additional circuitry in order to give sufficient gate, gate voltage in order to turn them on hard. So that can add to the level of complexity. It is not a, it's not a problem if, for example, you're using a 12 volt power supply, then you wouldn't have much problem turning I mean, on the I've gate. I've seen MOSFETs that have one volt 
If, if you look at the spec sheets, there aren't very many that have a one volt uh, gate voltage where they will turn, where their uh, channel resistance is very low. Quite often, these are spec at uh, some amount of leakage current, say a couple of milliamps at one volt, and yes, you get a couple of milli milliamps uh, of leakage current through them at one volt, but they wouldn't be very useful for for carrying, for example, a motor current. So you have to take at least to about three or four volts before you get uh, sufficiently low channel resistance to so that the voltage drop is, is minimal. But you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, MOSFETs are a, a very good way in which you can improve the efficiency of, of, uh, of um, uh, H-bridges. But they, they, do, they do tend to add to the complexity of the H-bridge, no question about that. Um, I, I think in one of the other slides I have a, an H-bridge which is made with MOSFETs, so we can have a look at that. Okay, so that's the, the choice of the current set with a 47K resistor. Uh, quite often uh, people uh, want to bump up the current or feel that you can get more power, but there's a real limit to that. And uh, so in other words, you don't go on much above 47K or lower the resistance down be, uh, below 47K unless you know what you're doing because what will happen is you'll simply get a lot more wasted power in the base current. So uh, a good way to do this is to use a potentiometer, adjust the puck until the voltage starts to rise across the transistors with the motor under load. So in other words, you take the motor, uh, you, you apply a signal across the H-bridge, adjust the values of the base resistor, and then, uh, and then you measure the voltage drop across the transistors to see whether or not it starts to rise. You, it, it'll come out of saturation pretty quickly, and there's always a trade-off between the saturation voltage and the losses associated with that, and the losses associated with this additional base current. Okay, here's a, a, another interesting uh, twist. This uh, HC39 139 is a, is a dual 104 decoder, and it's very definitely a logic chip. And uh, Mark Tilden has embraced it as a, a good way in which you can avoid uh, the problem of uh, smoking H bridges. These trans these H bridges are so-called smoking H bridges. That is to say, if you apply a negative voltage on each of these two inputs and turn on all four transistors at the same time, you'll definitely get uh, some some hot stuff, and you might smoke it. And so you always have to be careful about the application of these eight bridges. And you can avoid that by using uh, one of two decoder. In other words, the outputs there are mutually exclusive. They can only be either high or low. And so this is a recommended circuit for, for, for example, for use with microcores. And the reason why microcores are subject to a problem is that there the, the output voltage can be um, such that two outputs are active simultaneously and could smoke a conventional H bridge. So using this uh, uh, 104 decoder, you can avoid that. But in addition to that, and this is what is the interesting part of, about this is, you can use this also as a reverser circuit. And this is the, with the simple addition of two additional transit, uh, resistors in the base. And the way it works is this way. If um, the reversing circuit is based on uh, the sensors, tactile sensors, either left or right, or reverse sensors, uh, causing either one or both of these bridges to go into the reverse mode. So the bridges are reciprocating the motor back and forth at, in a standard walker arrangement, but the, you want to have a phase angle between these mo motors changed by 180 degrees for it to go, for example, to turn or for it to reverse and the way to do that is by selecting, uh, using one control input to select one, either one set of outputs versus the other set of outputs. So in that case, you either select 0 and 2 or 1 and 3. But notice that uh, by applying a logic level to input A, you select 0, which corresponds to the signal, this signal going through unreversed, and three, uh, making the signal go reverse. In other words, by selecting and, and setting, using a level on uh, input A, you can actually reverse the operation of the H-bridge. 
So just adding two resistors in addition to this conventional 139 H-bridge uh, driver circuit gives you the reversing function. Okay, let's go on to the next. Again, uh, I picked these circuits because they are kind of unique. They, I haven't seen this that, that particular solution to the problem before, and so that's the reason for bringing them up here as a way to, to show that when you take a conventional circuit, uh, don't hesitate to play around with it. Don't hesitate to um, and fully understand it and think of a better way to do the same, provide the same function. Here are two um, motor control circuits which are based on pulse width modulation. Uh, the, the top one is a very simple pulse width uh, modulation circuit. It can be done many different ways using a 555 timer, for example. In this particular case, I use a couple of Schmidt triggers, and uh, the diodes are in the feedback path across the first uh, oscillator. This oscillator provides a square wave output when the pot is precisely balanced. And when the pot is adjusted either up or down, it gives a narrow or wider pulse width. That pulse is amplified by the second stage, and that's applied then to the base of the power transistor, which provides a current to the motor. And by adjusting the pulse width that's applied to the motor, the motor will, uh, you can control the speed of the motor. And because the transistor is turning, turning on or off and turning on hard, there are, lo there are low losses involved with this. Another way of doing this would be, for example, to use uh, something like a 317 um, voltage regulator, and you could just just change the analog voltage that you're applying to the to the motor. But the voltage would be portion of the voltage would be dropped across the, the controlling device. And that would be called a linear regulator, but it would be lossy. So this has much lower loss than a linear regulator. Okay, at the bottom we have a kind of a unique circuit. It's a constant speed circuit, and it takes advantage of the fact that uh, the 3, 381 um, voltage sensor has a, uh, can be used as both as a, as a reference voltage and as a comparator. So this particular circuit works on the basis of uh, the voltage that's developed across the motor, which is proportional to the speed of the motor. And when this device turns off, which is a PMOS, uh, MOSFET, the, the voltage that's generated by the motor when it's rotating is going to be greater when it's unloaded compared to when it's loaded. This voltage uh, then influences the rate with which this, this uh, capacitor is discharged and this voltage sensor turns on. So the time that it takes for this capacitor to charge up is proportional to the speed of the of the motor, the RPM of the motor. And when the, uh, when the, the motor is loaded down, the speed or the, the pulse width is adjusted accordingly in order to maintain a constant speed. So loading the motor uh, will result in very small uh, change in the RPM. So this for constant um, speed applications, this is a very simple, very useful circuit. I haven't got a specific application in mind, but you can see that uh, when if, motor, if constant speed is important, then this type of a circuit and this type of feedback network would be very useful because it takes advantage of the fact that the motor acts like a generator, if you like, acts like its own tachometer. So the same type of signal that would be normally generated from a tachometer is generated by the motor itself. Again, a very simple uh, circuit and easy to put together. You can freeform the circuit and it, it provides this kind of functionality. This PMOS uh, device has to be one of the low gate vintage type devices. And uh, that's one of the problems with, you know, the trade off there is that you either use a larger power, uh, higher voltage supply. And this device here operates, you have to pick the highest voltage available in order to make sure that. Um, that it's compatible with the supply voltage. This, the J, I believe, is what, about 2.7? Uh, well, actually, the trigger is at about 3, because they all vary, right? Yeah. And maybe shuts off at 2.8. Okay. There's an interesting story about the 1381. It's a, it's a uh, 
you'll see it in many, many different designs. And it's actually originally designed as a reset circuit for uh, microcontrollers, CPUs. And the way it operates is that uh, under brownout conditions, when the power supply of, of a CPU-based circuit drops below the normal operating voltage, you would like to have some way in which you can intervene uh, with the, the normal operation of the CPU, which might otherwise go out of control. So by sensing the spool drop and then applying a reset to the, uh, to the reset pin of the CPU, then you can control the condition under which the, the circuit powers up and, and shuts down. So one of the, I've done a lot of circuit design uh, using CPUs and um, it makes a lot of difference whether or not you corrupt memory or whether or not it's a, uh, you have a very uh, uh, low probability of corrupting memory. There's no such thing as uh, abs absolute certainty that it will uh, tremendously increase the probability of shutting down in a, a your CPU circuit without having uh, any uh, side effects. So by using this for this particular application, it's kind of unusual, and you have to keep in mind a certain aspects of this. The input voltage here is the voltage that appears on the output. So unlike uh, some other devices where a comparator has a power supply and the output voltage swings between zero and the power supply, the output voltage of this, of this device, which also acts like a comparator, swings between ground and input voltage. Okay. Got a lot of ground to cover here, so I may speed things up a little bit. Okay. Here is one of the uh, servo controller circuits that uh, was developed uh, fairly recently. And um, again, this is an, an application of beam technology. Um, we call it beam technology. It's been around for a lot longer than Mark Tilden. And, uh, but nevertheless, the spirit of beam is a very powerful incentive to continue using these simple devices rather than uh, taking it and, and going to more complex solutions. Like for example, this particular circuit can be, for example, also done with a PIC or something like that. Uh, but you know, using a single hex inverter and a couple of passive components does the job. And not only that, but troubleshooting, putting it together, uh, the, 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 the lack of programming, the, the normal design cycle can be really speeded up. So this, this circuit uh, consists of two oscillators. And it has a high speed oscillator which operates around uh, 40 kilohertz and has the, um, uh, a, a pulse generator which generates the one, normally one millisecond pulses. It uses two inverters to buffer the outputs and it drives the LED uh, directly, taking advantage of the fact that you will, when this is turned high, positive, then the oscillation at this end causes a, a, an LED pulse stream which consists of 40 kilohertz pulses. And the, the width of that burst of 40 millisecond or, or 40 kilohertz pulses is determined by the setting of this this potentiometer. So by adjusting that, you can adjust the position of the hobby servo because this hobby servo uses the standard radio shock 40 kilohertz IR receiver, simple three pin device, takes the output of that and inverts it and applies it directly to the hobby servo. And now you can have remote control of the hobby servo and it can all be done with a single hex inverter. What's the advantage of having the infrared well, the idea is that uh, infrared, of course, means wireless. And uh, so it gives you the equivalent of a wireless control. So uh, the other thing you could consider is using this as part of an optocoupler. You could replace this, perhaps. Now, you wouldn't need to yeah. use a 40 kilohertz carrier in that case. But this actually provides you with quite a sensitive uh, uh, arrangement. You can use this, for example, at least two or three meters away from the, uh, from the servo. So, I use similar circuits over longer distances than that. But this particular circuit I've uh, tested to about three meters and, and it worked quite well. So a simple way in which you can adjust the position of a servo using new technology. Okay. This is a, a little bit more complex circuit. 
and uh, this uses combines a microcore with uh, two pulse width uh, controllers. And uh, the microcore is this circuit uh, using these four NB neurons. They're arranged in a ring, so that the output of the last stage is brought back to the input of the first stage. Uh, it uses these two diodes to kill so-called unwanted processes. And uh, this allows this uh, microcore to start up with a single process, which is really a pulse that goes from stage to stage. And by having the pulse appearing at each of these outputs, you can cause each of these pulse width modulation controllers to turn the servo first in one direction, stop, then turn that servo in the other direction, stop, turn this one back, stop, and turn that one back, stop. So you can alternate between the servos in the same way that uh, the normal beam circuit would use the output of a microcore connected to an H bridge and connected across a couple of motors to give you the same kind of reciprocating motion. Is that the circuit that the university used to do their the lab? Yes. Uh, do you remember which university that is? Yes, that's the University of Illinois. And uh, Scott Burns is a prof there. Uh, he contacted me about six months ago and asked me if he could use the circuit. This was posted on the, on the mailing list. And he asked me if uh, it would be all right to incorporate that in his, in his uh, teaching materials. And um, some two months ago or so, he uh, made an announcement that uh, 140 freshmen uh, using this circuit built a variety of robots that, uh, that were uh, unique to say the least. It was, it was, a, fabulous, it was a fabulous project. Uh, they had little devices that had unique uh, methods of movement, and then you had a virtual patent office. You came up with an idea of group work, you could patent it, and somebody else wanted to borrow uh, that concept. Uh, what was they had to pay for it with virtual dollars. Yeah, the virtual and, dollars. And you could trade ideas back and forth and using money. Yeah, it translated into a final grade. Like if you right. pat, did nothing but use it, everybody else's patented, patented concept, then uh, your grade went down and their grade went up. So you got rewarded more for getting your own, but you know, if you're really messed up, you'd still use somebody else's patent. Really so you could win if you were a good designer or a good salesman, right? Yeah, yeah. The website's really interesting if you can dig it up because it shows both this circuit uh, to many very interesting like they actually have video and uh, pictures of the works, really bizarre electric devices and the methods of locomotion. And, and all he did was he used proto, proto boards for the, the actual circuit assembly and just um, gave a, a nice step by step assembly um, procedure because these guys are freshmen, they're young kids, and uh, they were putting together these, these uh, circuits in a relatively short time. And the whole contest, I think there were about 30 teams or so, but over 140. Uh, people involved in, yeah, in the gallery in the images is amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I highly recommend uh, you search that out on the on the in the archive yeah. and uh, and look at all of those pictures. We even have a link on solarbars.com. I'll have to double check that. It's really ingenious. See the one there was a canoe work and it's pretty ingenious because it had two servos that would grow one side and then swivel back and roll on the other side, back and forth using the circuit. It was, it was brilliant. And that's actually interesting too because these were kids who didn't really have any experience in beam design, so they had no pre preconceptions about what a robot should look like. So, um, under the imagination, and look what happens, you get all kinds of unique ideas that are developed. And it doesn't really take much, as long as, you're, as, long as you don't uh, have a narrow view of things and allow your imagination to take over. You can come up with your own unique designs. And this is uh, tried and proven, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, of course, uh, when you have 140 people using the same circuit, problems there were problems, and they would show up pretty quick. Okay, this is um, an example of uh, again using some logic to kind of push the state of the art um, beam circuits. Very similar to a conventional beam circuit, but make, taking advantage of the additional logic functions that are. In, in these uh, circuits. Even these are very, very simple logic devices. I mean, these are NAND gates. They're a little special in the fact that they have uh, Schmitt trigger inputs. So they can be used as a substitute, for example, for the HC14 devices, which are often used. Um, this is a bi uh, circuit and generates um, the, uh, 
the outputs of that are amplified using a couple of drive transistors, and that controls the, the, the two motors. The direction of the motors, in this case, is uh, controlled by the output of the um, double pole, double throw relays. I mentioned to you these relays can be configured as an H bridge, and you can clearly see how these devices act like a, like a figure H type configuration. And you can see that current passes through when these two contacts are closed. And then when the contacts switch over, current passes through in the other direction. Um, this is a very conventional, conventional uh, design for, for robots. And the sumo robots uh, this morning, many of them use these uh, relays. But what is a little different about this is that I use the so-called bistable relay. The bistable relay actually has a coil which maintains its position. It's not the spring return type coil. So in this case, I give uh, the bistable relay, there comes in a variety of uh, configurations as far as the coil is concerned. But if you apply a positive and a negative pulse across the coil, you can change the position of the, uh, of the relay contacts. So by using a capacitor, as the interface between the uh, reverse and turn circuit and the coil, I can provide bipolar pulses to these to the coils without having to use a bipolar power supply. And the main reason for doing that is that it doesn't require any more power. Once you change the state of the coil, it, uh, it maintains that position of the contact and doesn't draw any additional power. So there's only a transient current pulse required to change the position of the, of the relay contact. Can I just so, Yeah. Um, I was going Grant and I were doing this. Many experiments that we already quite had them, and the failure rate was, was about 20%. A lot of the relays would not hold their state, unfortunately. They so will, they would, will they reverse, or? Uh, they would They would walk one direction and not walk back with the same signal pulse, the opposite polarity, which is very unusual, I thought. Yeah. But uh, just, just so you're aware of that, yeah, in, in theory, this should work. Oh yes, <laughs> when they work, they work yeah. lovely. I, I think. In, uh, did you try uh, raising power supply voltage uh, or uh, increasing the size of the capacitors? Oh yes, they, well, we were running it off of a uh, pair of forty seven hundred uh, capacitors, mm -hmm. but it was on solar solar circuits, like a Miller engine, solar engine type, type of thing. Yeah, I would have to have a closer look at it to see because. There's no reason why this circuit doesn't work. It's, this is a, one of the recommended well, ways in which you can control these the coils. So when they're, when they're working, they work dynamic. Okay, but what you're saying is you have to select devices that will actually work. Yeah, right. So you have to watch the relays on those. Did, did you buy these relays surplus or brand new? No, these are brand new from Digi. So I was just as shocked as anything because these relays were like four or five dollars a piece, which is a bit much to eat for a. Uh, yeah, piece. I think there there were some available from. Um, all electronics, I think, much lower price. Sure. I have no idea. I, I use a surplus. Uh, I use a surplus relay, and assume that um, you know most relays will behave this way. Obviously, you have to be a little bit careful. And uh, if you're interested in designing something like this or, or building one of these, you better get in touch with uh, Dave and, and find out which relay actually works. Um, again, uh, this is a simple type of anding arrangement where. Uh, either the left uh, or the right sensors are are uh, triggered and cause the, the appropriate uh, relay to flip state, or uh, both can be simultaneously flipped by a single switch, a reverse switch. So the, the left and, and, and right would cause a, a turn, and the reverse would cause it to back up. So the sensor would be the reverse sensor would be on the front, the left and the right would probably be on the front uh, corners. Uh, there's another uh, interesting little switch there called the panic switch. And uh, the way that this circuit works is it, it alternately turns on one or the other motor. So uh, a, a roller which is using the circuit will move in a kind of a jogging fashion forward. But in some cases, you would like it to quickly back away from something. And in this particular case, uh, I cause the, um, the uh, panic mode Will, if that's triggered, will cause it to turn both motors on simultaneously, so therefore quickly uh, get out of the way instead of going at half speed with every <coughs> every uh, the motor going alternately, uh, turning on alternately. I need to jump yep. Okay. So I was wondering if uh, um, we've another lecture on, on 
Okay. Actually, in a way that kind of works out, if uh, you, you're going to be here tomorrow, there's another lecture tomorrow, and I can cover the remainder of it in that uh, lecture. Did you show up to do probably? I haven't actually done that yet. Um, I can, yeah, okay. Just to show you just how simple things can be uh, kept. Uh, it's actually possible to construct a walker using a single servo, and this particular circuit uh, uses. Um, it's a walker, but it's a special walker in that it requires a, uh, a rough surface to, to move on. So I think we actually have, I'll try it on this shirt to see whether or not the will have to work. Yeah, there's a, right, but I think it will probably work a little bit better on this. And you can see how it works. And so it actually crawls along using the friction between the legs So this is about as simple a walker as you can make. Back it up one more time. He's got light sensor. It has light sensors, so it's it's photosensitive. Um, it's not that sensitive, so that it, in a diffused light like this, it won't actually clearly turn towards the light. But if you take, um, for example, a flashlight, or if you have a bright light in the field of vision, it will turn clearly turn towards the the um, the light source. Okay. So what's kind of unique about this uh, is that the fact that it requires a rough surface for it to to move, and that's uh, the exact opposite of many walkers, which require a very smooth surface to walk properly. Yeah. But I think only on, like, for example, on a on a rough carpet, this works very well, very efficient because it digs right into the carpet. So on, on the whole, how many circuits do you actually build the ones you design? Like this is one of the rare examples. No, actually I try out uh, each of the subsections, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the circuit design quite often is a, it's a modular approach. And so you know, each of the subsections will be built and tested out on a protoboard. And quite often the whole thing will be put on a protoboard. Unfortunately, that is not very long lasting because you know onto the next project. But um, I do have about um, ten or so robots, heads, and various other circuits. And it's a pity I couldn't bring more. And I'll make sure that I bring out some next year. <laughs> okay, I just pass this around. One thing it uses a lithium-ion battery, and um, that's kind of unique in itself. Very lightweight, four volts, and uh, 100 and. 13 milliamp per hour capacity per. What's the lithium ion battery out of? It's like kind of an odd size. That's a camcorder. It's a standard size. Yeah, most of the battery packs are made up out of those. They uh, require very careful charging, and um, they're um, they are somewhat dangerous because if they're overcharged, they'll either self-destruct or they can catch on fire. And there have been some instances. Of that. Okay, uh, just a couple. I'll just really whiz through these guys and just see what you. And just to get a feel for all the other stuff that we uh, talked about. This is a stepper design, just a unipolar stepper motor. It uses the um, same bicore arrangement, speed control, and a couple of uh, four MOSFETs in order to uh, uh, interface between the, the stepper coils. Um, lets the turn on and indicate the state of the, uh, the outputs and uh, diodes to uh, take the uh, back EMF. Simple way in which you can interface a beam circuit to a stepper. This is a, an example of an SE, and this this particular one is a so-called Type 3 SE, which is uh, sensitive to the slope of uh, of the charging current. And uh, this is a little bit uh, unique in, in some ways because uh, most most of the solar engines are actually Type 1 or Type 2, I should say, so voltage sensitive. Um, this particular circuit uh, is uh, works on the basis of the current passing through the base emitter of the Q1 and into the capacitor C1, and it, uh, during that time Q2 and Q3 are turned off, remain off, until the current uh, passes through Q1 and is developed across P1, which is a potentiometer, drops below the 0.6 volt voltage, and at that point the Q1 will turn off which was, uh, in the meantime, holding off Q2, 
And when this turns off, Q2 turns on, Q3 turns on, and it operates like a conventional latch in a solar, solar engine and discharges a capacitor. So this one will charge up to uh, the full capacity of the battery, of the, of the, uh, of this capacitor. And uh, when it reaches the full capacity, it will discharge instead of using a voltage as a trigger. And so even under low light conditions, it, you know, it doesn't have any more voltage to deliver to the capacitor, it'll still trigger. So it's, it's kind of sensitive to variations in light. There's a, another point here that I'd like to point out. This is the, this is the charging uh, current of a solar cell. And I compare that with the um, voltage source resistors, current limiting resistor way in which quite often uh, circuits are tested out. And there's a big difference in the way that uh, these two circuits behave. Uh, they look the same and they behave somewhat the same, but they are different. If you look at the slope of the solar cell, you notice that as long as the voltage is relatively uh, below the maximum amount of voltage, the slope is almost straight. It's a linear slope. So the, uh, the solar cell actually causes a capacitor to charge up, not with an exponential voltage rising uh, waveform, but actually a linear rising waveform. So that means that uh, uh, for the time required to charge up to one volt, to two volts, to three volts, is roughly equal amount of time. This is different from a conventional RC network where I have an ex exponential time constant, which is shown here with this R circuit where the current is limited actually by a resistor. That's uh, very important when you're designing with uh, these circuits that are, are sensitive to the rate because you need to know that when it, the rate starts to drop quickly, that it happens at the end of charge. It's not a real gradual process. So you take advantage of that. Here is a quick look at another circuit called a dark energy charger, question mark. What's interesting about this is that it's a real uh, sort of like a uh, little bit of magic. The uh, solar cell is capable of only delivering 5.5 volts. And yet, if you measure the voltage, uh, uh, the way I've shown it there with this uh, little voltmeter, it will actually read uh, 8.3 volts. Uh, only if you cover the solar cell. So the magic is you cover the solar cell, and the voltage of the solar cell, solar cell goes to zero, and yet the voltage seems to rise suddenly if you can take a reading. Well, the trick there is that uh, the solar cell is charging up these two capacitors through the two diodes, and so you have two voltages, one across each of the two capacitors. Now, if you were to connect the, the bottom of one capacitor to the top of the other capacitor, they are actually connected in series, if you look at it carefully. And then the voltage across the two of those would be the sum of the two voltages. And that, and that happens when the solar cell is is dark because it effectively causes the, the voltage to collapse on a solar cell. Now the 100K resistor provides the short circuit. The current would be very limited in this case, and it's only capable of delivering enough voltage or current to the meter, so it has to be a digital volt meter or something like that. But it is quite interesting to look at a circuit and suddenly see voltages that are greater than are theoretically possible. Well, I use this, the same phenomenon here to, uh, in a flasher circuit. And the way it works is that, or sorry, in a, this would be a, a motor type circuit, like a, a conventional solar engine, which produces a burst of, uh, of motor rotation when it's triggered. What's nice about this is it allows you to use a, a one ferret or some large uh, supercapacitor, which generally have a voltage limitation of two and a half volts, and yet deliver a higher voltage across the motor by using two of these. They are charged in parallel from a 2.7 volt solar cell, and then when it triggers, they are automatically put in a series and provides double the voltage across the motor. So this is a, a way in which you can double, it's a voltage doubler, but it's a very special kind of voltage doubler. Most voltage doublers use a high frequency oscillator and a charge pump and give you a large voltage across the capacitor. In this case, I'm taking advantage of the fact that these capacitors have such a low voltage that you, you can't charge them up to any higher than two and a half volts, but I can put them in series when the time comes that I need the output. By putting them in series, I can get double the voltage, although I only get half the capacitors. Still, with a one pair of capacitor, half pair is plenty good enough for a lot of motors, and the motor will run for quite a long time on that. And of course, because of the higher voltage, it will run a lot faster than it might otherwise. 
this is a slight variation on that, and this is interesting from a perspective that these two uh, transistors are turned on by using the base current from one and connected to the other. So they act like diodes, just like those diodes, and they're turned on by the base current. Now, you would expect that this would be a problem once the voltage across the diode reverses. But what happens in fact is that when the voltage across the these transistors is reversed, you're swapping the emitter and the collector. It's an unconventional way of, for using a transistor, but it still behaves like an NPN or a PNP transistor. The only problem is the gain is very low. But that suits me just fine, because I don't like to have very high gain when they're reverse biased. In fact, I would pre prefer them to have zero gain. In fact, the gain is about one, slightly less than one. So the only current that passes through is leakage current, which is equivalent to the current that's limited by this base resistor. So, in effect, I have created diodes which have very, very low forward voltage drop, even lower than the uh, 1N34 uh, germanium diodes, because these are transistors that are turned off to saturation, and at very low currents, there are virtually no voltage drop. So I can charge these capacitors up to the full potential of their solar cell. But when they reverse bias, they behave like diodes, although they are quite leaky. I don't care. I only need them to be reverse biased for a fairly short period of time. Again, a kind of a unique application of a uh, little bit of uh, circuit design that uh, you don't often see. <laughs> yeah, doing, doing it in an unconventional way quite often leads to some interesting solutions to problems. Okay, um, this is um, Power Smart Head. Um, you, some of you have followed the uh, development of the Power Smart Head. This is bottom one is the simplest of all the Power Smart Head designs. It uses the output of a what is called a, an opti optical bridge. Again, the same idea of the balance point of the bridge is a voltage, which is mid potential, and the voltage on the two, or the light on the two uh, photodiodes is equal. And using the so-called monocore, which is really an oscillator, when this voltage is exactly at the threshold, this acts like an oscillator, and is either positive or negative when there is a big imbalance on the bridge. And I take advantage of the fact that when it oscillates, I can take the output of the, the, of the oscillator and charge up a, a couple of capacitors. These are the so-called new neurons. And these two, when they're turned on, produce the same voltage across the, the motor. And since there's the same voltage across the motor, there's no current flowing through the motor. So when the bridge is balanced, this circuit oscillates, the outputs are the same voltage and no current. It's power smart in the sense that no current is required when you're already pointing to the light source. And when the bridge is unbalanced, it will track towards the light source, and when it gets to the light source, it remains, it, it, it turns off and saves power. And this is a solar version. I think I'm going to have to break here, right? Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry well, okay. Uh, but it uh, looks like we still have uh, some water left for tomorrow, so we yes. actually want to discuss more of the more interesting circuits.